We're speaking today with Dr. Rochelle Walensky, director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. She was chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at Massachusetts General Hospital and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Walensky is a past chair of the Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council at the National Institutes of Health. Previously, she served as an advisor to both the World Health Organization and the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS. Dr. Olensky, we welcome you to Conversations on Healthcare today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it's great. You know, when I, I when I think about wearing masks, uh, I think about safety. You know, when I come out of my uh, house, I put my mask on. If I go into a, a public setting, I'm wearing my mask. And, uh, you know, it's a little, I think, analogous to when I get in my car and put on my seatbelt. So I, I can, I guess, understand why there's a little consternation uh, in the country when all of a sudden my cheese got moved in terms of what I think uh, uh, mask wearing was, was all about for so many people. I'm wondering if you could just share with our listeners just a high overview of what the new CDC policy is, and then uh, really talk a little maybe about the science behind it. And then you've gotten a lot of feedback. I'm wondering if you've heard anything that was constructive where you thought, you know, a, a, a point well made. Um, thank you for that. So yes, things changed on Thursday, and I will let's just acknowledge where we are 16 months later into yeah. this pandemic. Um, all those things that we have been telling you to do, we're now telling you it's okay not to do. And change is hard, especially you know since we've been so locked down for for such a long period of time. Um, so maybe what I will say is the the new guidance that we put out is for fully vaccinated people. And the guidance reads that if you are fully vaccinated, um, it is safe to take off your mask in essentially all settings. Um, certainly there were some carve outs, not during travel, not during in healthcare settings, not in correctional facilities, but for the most part in all general public settings, it's safe for an individual who's fully vaccinated to take off their mask. Um, we also wanna be sure that everyone knows that if you're immunocompromised for any reason, you should consult your doctor before taking off your mask. Um, how did we get here? So there were several big things that were really moving us. One is um, our case rates are really quite a bit down. They're down just over the last two weeks by 30%. And they're, they're at rates we haven't seen really since last spring, mm -hmm. over a year ago. Two is vaccine is available for everyone now. 90% mm -hmm. um, of Americans live within five miles of a shot. Um, and there is enough vaccine such that if you want it, you should be able to have access to it. So those are two things that are going on outside the science. What's happening within the science was several studies, um, just even over the last two to three weeks. Um, and they were they kind of bucket into three different areas. One is what I call the real world effectiveness studies. The studies that said um, that the vaccine is working in the real world, just like it did in the clinical trials. The effectiveness is somewhere between 90 to 95 to 97%. Two is that the vaccines are actually working against the variants that we have here in the United States. And there was just recent data about that. And then three is data that was not examined in the clinical trials. And the question was, if you're vaccinated, can you asymptomatically get infection and potentially give it to something, mm -hmm. somebody else? And emerging data has really demonstrated that that doesn't happen either. So at the coalescence of all of this new science and the intersection of cases coming down and vaccines being available, we really thought now was the time to release that guidance. Great. Well, I thought there's some very good news in that. And uh, I appreciate that we get to sit in the studio fully vaccinated <laughs> and not wearing a mask, which we did not do for the entire year of the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, I want to uh, focus maybe a little bit on the uh, the kids now. And I'll I'll start by saying in, in January and February, uh, I had never met so many people over the age of 100 in my life as we did at our mass vaccine clinics when we first rolled it out. And they were an incredibly That's appreciative right. group of people to get the vaccine. And we marked on down the timeline, you know, the 80 plus people, 75, um, down to the 50s and beyond. And now we arrive at our at our young people. And we know that children account for about 22% of new COVID cases in the United States. While many have mild illness, we certainly know there are also some very severe cases. Um, we're wondering uh, what your message is to the parents of which the survey showed maybe only about 30% of parents plan to 
vaccinate their 12 and up children right now. I think we're hearing from our frontline teams that sometimes those kids are bringing in their parents saying, get me vaccinated. I never want to be in quarantine again. And I think we have to remember on top of homeschooling, there was quarantine whenever they did get exposed. But what's your message to parents and educators about the risk to children of COVID, uh, the benefit of the vaccine and what they can expect in the coming months in terms of kids being able to go back to what we hope is a normal life? Right. Um, so first, I think let's celebrate yet another moment last week, which is that we had the um, authorization and recommendation to give the Pfizer vaccine um, to 12 to 15 year olds. This is the first vaccine that's available to kids um, lower than the age of 16 and now all the way down to 12. Um, our data have shown that you know people haven't necessarily wanted to be first, but they're really willing and, and confidence increases over time. And I think that we'll see that again here. I can tell you, um, I have a 16 year old. He mm -hmm. was vaccinated as soon as it was available yeah. to him. Yeah. Um, and I was encouraging that. And I think you're exactly right. I have received so many pictures in, from texts of these high school studio, uh, stadiums where filled with like really excited kids to get back and vaccinated. And as you know, when we've had more and more people who are vaccinated who are older, our cases are now concentrating in our younger population. Mm -hmm. We do know that our teens tend to act um, from a transmission standpoint, like our, our 20 year olds or older adults so that we know that they can actually transmit. And what we really want is to allow them to get back to their lives. Right. You know, when we think about what the toll has been for them with schools with real milestones that have lost, many have lost graduations. I have one myself who's lost a graduation. Um, and so they, I think they are really enthusiastic um, about getting vaccinated. Our clinical trial um, that they did in these teens demonstrated it was 100% effective and no different safety signals than we had. Certainly they may have the sore arm that we all got. Sure. Um, they may have a little bit of um, aches and feel fevers or headaches the day or so after, but for the most part, the symptoms are exactly the same as the adults. So my message is let's like give our kids their lives back and get them vaccinated. Yeah. Well, that's great. My, my youngest graduated from high school this last weekend and it was a wonderful event. Uh, so I know they're very happy. You know, I want to go back and, and uh, pull the thread on your comment earlier about the clinical trials and try to figure out, uh, you know, those trials told us, I forget when in November, that the vaccines were safe and uh, effective uh, um, for us to start taking. Tell us a little more about those clinical trials, because they're still going on and they have some important information they're going to be able to tell us somewhere along the line. I think they're at least saying now publicly uh, the vaccine's good for six months. It may be good for much longer, but we science really likes to go back and look at those clinical trials. Who's keeping an eye on those? What are we learning from them? It doesn't, I don't ever sense, not that people are hiding it, but a sense of transparency. Maybe it's too geeky <laughs> to sort of be talking about those trials, but they will be a harbinger for what might happen in terms of things like a booster or whether or not there is a, an annual, uh, as many people have to get for influenza, an annual shot. What, what are you learning? What do you, when, when will we hear word about uh, what's happening there? So the clinical trials um, provided us information with two months of safety data, which allowed us to have the authorization. And what we're really now looking at is six months of data, which will allow us to have the approval that uh, uh, Pfizer has just put forward. And so some of those, um, we don't expect any signals there at all. We're, we're certainly going to follow, we'll see what they say, but um, I don't imagine that they would have put forward with the approval if there wasn't just good news to share. Um, certainly some of the people who participated in the trial and received placebo perhaps have opted to get the vaccine in the interim. So, so we may have lost some of our power in that situation in terms of long-term two-year follow-up, but we are looking at the two-year follow-up and those trials will go on and, and look at follow-up up to um, two years. So um, they're continuing to do their work. I think that there isn't really news to share with regard to them, which is why you haven't heard a whole lot. Although we will hear something after the approval is, is uh, uh, received. Your point is, um, well taken with regard to boosters though. So among the things that we're looking at, not just in the trial, but really in the real world studies as well, is 
what happens to our immunity? Does it wane over time? Mm -hmm. um, I want to be very clear to people. When we talk about boosters, that doesn't mean you're not protected now. The question, and because that has caused some confusion, the question is not, do we need you know, a third today? You are, if you get your two doses, you're protected now. What we want to see is if in a year from now, you will continue to be protected. So we're looking at those data, not just in the trial, but in clinical studies as well. Where we're worried most about that to start is among the population that got vaccinated first, of course, and that's our long-term care facilities where people might not have had a robust immune right. response to right. start. So we really want to make sure that they're going to maintain protection. Well, Dr. Walensky, uh, we appreciated uh, your recent uh, statement, uh, and it really echoes that of so many uh, great leaders around the country that racism is a threat to public health mm -hmm. uh, in this country. And it has been for a very long time, but we've zeroed in on it this year with the unmistakable reality in front of us of what we saw. Uh, the Biden administration, the American Recovery Plan has many provisions that are uh, focused on addressing inequity in health. And we've really been intrigued by this rebuilding of the public health workforce and infrastructure and in some new ways in this country. Uh, I noted the Public Health AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps being a Our program favorite. we've championed <laughs> for, uh, for many years. Uh, community health workers, also public health specialists. Uh, from your perch, you know, leading CDC, how are you going to use these resources and this kind of new and revitalized workforce to address uh, racism as a public health issue in this country and to really help us move much closer to health equity? Um, thank you for that question. So uh, while we had big news on masking last week, we had extraordinary news on investments about in our future. And that's really what, um, I, I'm super excited about how are we going to take over $7 billion and strengthen the public health system that we have, a system that has lost over 50,000 jobs just in the last decade. Mm -hmm. And what I think is really important as we do so is not just um, investing in new people, but in training people in a diversity and keeping in a diversity of disciplines from genomic epidemiology to contact tracing and, and all across the spectrum. One of the things that's critically important to me as we do this is to make sure our workforce looks like the people they serve yeah. um, and really ensure that we have the diversity in that workforce, be it urban or rural, be it African-American or Hispanic, and to make sure at all areas of the workforce, we're, we're training people that look like the people that we, they serve, because those are actually how we make those contacts, those trusted messengers. Um, certainly, as you know, um, I feel very strongly uh, as an infectious disease doc, as a person who trained during in taking care of patients with HIV and AIDS, we knew and have known all along that there have been extraordinary disparities in health. We're taking this moment in COVID where we've seen it yet again and, and to call it now totally inexcusable and to take these new investments moving forward and to make sure that we invest and make sure it's that people understand this about where they work and how they travel to work and where they play and where they pray and to make sure we have investments in those areas um, to ensure health everywhere. We're speaking today with Dr. Rochelle Walensky, Director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. You know, I want to connect the dots between our conversation about boosters and the public health uh, system. And I'm thinking a little bit about the hubs that we all created here in Connecticut. Our health center uh, was asked by the governor to set up four large mass vaccination sites. Uh, this upcoming week, we'll have delivered our 500,000 dose uh, of the vaccine. Uh, and those hubs were really important uh, for everyone in our, in our state. Uh, but we've also developed lots of spokes uh, that are out in the community. They're, they're at the immigrant center. They're at, uh, you know, the food pantry. They're really in the neighborhoods. Um, but I'm worried a little bit about the states now seem to be saying maybe the mass vax, uh, the hubs are, their work is completed. They're, certainly we're seeing we're on this side of the bell curve. Our own numbers show that. Um, but if, if something goes wrong, our lesson learned on this whole thing is we didn't have a distribution system right. uh, in place. Uh, we weren't using the private offices, uh, but uh, I think the Biden administration got the pharmacies, has started to recruit pediatricians, has done all that. But I'm thinking, 
uh, hope for the best and fear for the worst. Uh, how, how will we be prepared for that large distribution? God forbid we need it uh, to stand those up again if we're taking them down. Uh, what's your sense as you think about the, the, the infrastructure over the 50 states and the territories of how we can make sure that this never happens again, that we're caught short in terms of our ability to deliver doses as quickly as possible to as many people? Yeah, so that's a great question. I have a few responses to that. One is we never had a vaccine distribution plan for adults. We have a vaccine distribution plan for children, but we never had one for adults. And, and in fact, our flu vaccination rates, which are you know somewhere right. around 40 to 60 percent right. every season, right. um, probably demonstrate that. Right. right. We should be far higher than that. Um, and so now we very well may need one. We have one for children that works pretty well. So maybe now is the time to, to capitalize on this moment and say, we're gonna need a vaccination plan for adults. Um, also, I wanna say that, you know, one of the things I feel really strongly about and one of the, the silver linings of this is we've made those inroads. We've created those hubs, we've created those spokes, we've, we've met, created this network of trusted people um, and I really feel like we need to not just keep it for boosters, but to keep it for hypertension control mm -hmm. and to keep it for um, where 11 million childhood vaccinations behind. Um, so we need to keep it for, to make sure we get those children caught up on their measles vaccinations and to do all of the um, other stuff that we should be doing in the community. Why are we not doing diabetes training in the community at the food pantry that just delivered your COVID vaccine? Yeah. So we've made some of these networks. We've, we've created a system of people who are willing and wanting to engage, willing and wanting to help, reaching people where they are. And we've done that now. Let's let's like solidify it and make sure that we actually can engage in that for all other areas of health. Well, I am really glad you uh, addressed all that other stuff because that's exactly where I wanted to go next. So here, here you have this amazing organization, uh, the CDC, and if we can take our eye uh, not off of COVID, but maybe at least broaden our gaze uh, for a moment, uh, opioid crisis didn't go away while this was going on. People continued to die all over the United States from opioid uh, addiction and overdose, uh, certainly uh, the issues that we see with obesity, the climbing rates of diabetes, continued uh, concerns with HIV AIDS. We, we don't need to make the whole long list, but as you uh, come into uh, this position, I know you've, you've been there for a little while now, uh, what's, your, uh, what's your picture for CDC's role and its, its vision even beyond uh, the COVID pandemic, which will end uh, at some point to, to really address these enormous uh, public health issues of consequence in the country. What's what's the game plan or the vision for CDC going forward? The big goal, right? Um, yeah. So I maybe I'll break it down to several. And one is the public health infrastructure of the country. And that's, you know, $7.4 billion that we've talked about before. But I do think we need to invest in workforce we need to invest in, in laboratory structure and we need to invest in data modernization across this country. Um, that doesn't necessarily feel like we're disease specific, but I do think that if we have a more established public health mm -hmm. workforce, if we, can, um, if we can report labs and really understand where issues are happening, if they can integrate and we re really can see them at the local level, we will be better off and better serving our communities to know where we need to target intervention. So, big public health infrastructure mm -hmm. um, that needs to happen with data modernization. Two is health equity. We've also talked about that. Again, not necessarily disease specific, but layered on top of the public health infrastructure, if we really take a, an intentional um, view of all the work that we're doing within with an equity lens. And, and I have challenged my own organization to do this. I said, please do not document the problem anymore. You can document it, but now is the time to yeah. test interventions mm -hmm. to see if they work. Um, and some will and some won't, and we can't be afraid to fail. Let's fail fast and learn what we have and, and move on to another intervention that might work. Because I just, I don't want year after year for us to just say we have a more of a problem. So we do need to do a lot of work in health equity. And then, you know, you raised numerous issues. I could list many more. Um, 
certainly we have to do something about mental health and opioids mm-hmm. in this country. It's, it's, um, it was bad before the pandemic. It got worse during the pandemic. And we have young people, old people dying of mental health disease and of opioid overdose and then of opioid, um, you know, collateral damage of opioids, infections and, and whatnot. So, so opioids and mental health, maternal mortality, one of the highest rates of maternal mortality around the world um, affects Af- uh, African-Americans and Asian Pacific communities almost twofold more than anywhere else. Um, so, you know, there are many, many, and ending the HIV epidemic, which which had such momentum and then mm-hmm. kind of lost mm-hmm. the momentum over the last year. So lots of different areas there. there I do hope that the public health infrastructure, the investment in equity will raise so many of these. Mm-hmm. I, I worry a lot about community violence, domestic violence, um, mm-hmm. gun injury prevention. So, so lots of different areas that we're, we're hoping that we're hoping to focus on um, when we can take a little bit of our eye off yeah. the pandemic yeah. and even while we have our eye yeah. on the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Well, let me just get one last question in. Uh, and we're doing so well uh, in the Biden administration, your leadership on uh, thinking about the country, but. America is one of the most consequential uh, nations in the world. And uh, we look around, we see on our TV uh, how the pandemic is sweeping over India, causing so much tragedy and hardship. Uh, It was good to see that the president had announced that uh, I think it was 60 million additional doses were going. But it's a it's a large uh, planet uh, with lots of needs. What's our role? We had Dr. Van Kirchhoff Mm -hmm. from WHO on last week, and she was really talking about building this partnership, this global partnership. What's the role the CDC is going to play in the advocacy? And it's so difficult sometimes because certainly our country is interested in making sure all of our citizens are vaccinated, but we play such an important role globally. How do you envision the CDC in terms of its uh, global responsibility? This is critically important, I think, from both a humanitarian perspective, but also because um, I I think it's been said, no one is safe until everyone is safe, right? right? Um, And I think if you look at what has plagued our country over the last 10 years between H1N1, Zika, Ebola, and COVID-19, none of them started here. Right. Yeah. So we really do have a critical key role to play. Um, and and really in COVID-19 as well, our, va- our vaccines will only work if we don't have circulating virus in other places that create variants when threaten it. Right. So um, much of CDC's work has really been in partnership. We have collaborations in 60 countries. Um, so while there was uh, uh, um, Ebola happening in Guinea and DRC. We had people on the ground there because we had long-standing relationships there. When you know India was calling and saying, you know, we, or we were following and seeing that they were having challenges. We have a 20-year-old country office in India, and we were able to provide technical support and oxygen to get there, and and PPE, and how do you roll out vaccines and vaccine safety data collection, and all that sort of support. And so that's much of what CDC has role has been is the technical support on the ground, the deployment of people into Brazil. We have two teams in Brazil to be able to provide that on the ground support with lessons that we have learned here in the United States. We've been speaking today with Dr. Rochelle Walensky, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You can learn more about this agency's vitally important work by going to cdc.gov and follow her on Twitter at CDC Director. Dr. Walensky, thank you so much for your career-long contribution to health, to infectious disease, for lending your sensitivity to the needs of vulnerable populations, for leading the CDC, and for joining us today on Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the work you all do. Great. Thank Thank you you. again. Doing a great job. Yeah. (laughs)